Throughout wrestling history, there have been a lot of grapplers with supposed boundless upside, but for whatever reason, we're never able to reach their true star potential. And in my opinion, historically at least, one man and one man alone fits that bill better than anyone else. Monday Night Burger. 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 Yes, that is who I was referring to. From the moment Larry Fall debuted in Florida Championship Wrestling in 1985, he was heralded as wrestling's next big superstar. In fact, it was pretty common during the 80s for the magazines to tout Lex Luger as the heir apparent to Hulk Hogan. With long blonde hair that was thicker than the Hulkster's, arguably a better physique, and a comic book based name of his own to boot, Luger's fate as the man who would carry wrestling into the 90s was practically sealed. It wouldn't be fair to call Luger's first run in WCW a flop, but you could say it fell short of expectations. He first debuted as Ole Anderson's replacement in the Four Horsemen in early 87, before turning on the group and feuding with Ric Flair for most of 88. But unlike Hogan in the WWF, Luger was not portrayed as a world-beating hero, failing repeatedly to dethrone Flair for the world title due to outside forces. Luger did have a mammoth US title reign from 89 to 90, but he didn't win the big one until the Nature Boy Boy was famously ousted from the company in 91. What should have been his crowning moment at that year's Great American Bash was drowned out by fans chanting, We want flair, and led to a clunky heel turn, one of the many he would have just in those first four years alone. By the end of 91, Luger's confidence in the company was at an all time low as he took time off while still the champion. After not appearing in a match for nearly two months, Luger put over his good friend Sting on his way out in a less than inspired match at Super Brawl in February of 92. Far more notable than the match itself was Luger's size, as he had ballooned to nearly 300 pounds in his absence. So much for WCW's new steroid policy. Considering how much of a star Lex had become during that run, it's no surprise that Vincent Mann would come calling. After a weird false start, Luger in the WWF was positioned to become one of the sport's next great main eventers. But instead, his time in the World Wrestling Federation turned out to be a massive bust and served as a somewhat cautionary tale about putting all your eggs into one muscle-bound basket. How did it happen? Let's find out as we explore Lex Luger in the WWF. But first... 13 of the world's greatest bodybuilders, and now me, Lex Luger. In 1991, the World Bodybuilding Federation made its debut, one of the many examples of McMahon not knowing when to stay in his lane. Mixing the physiques of professional bodybuilding with the silly characters of pro wrestling, the WBF had a clear mission to topple the far more established International Federation of Bodybuilding. Now, I won't get into the gritty details of the WBF in this video, but let's just say, they did not accomplish their goal. After his run in Atlanta ended, Luger signed a deal with the WBF, both to work around WCW's non-compete clause and to indulge in his own hobby of bodybuilding. His first appearance actually took place at WrestleMania 8 in a pre-taped promo advertising the new league. Vince had hoped Luger's involvement as co-host would convince fans to put down the remote and stick around for WBF body stars. But just days before the 1992 WBF championship meet that June, Luger was involved in a motorcycle accident and was unable to perform instead cutting a promo from his hospital bed. He did get a nifty steel plate put into his forearm, which would benefit him later, so it wasn't a total wash. In fact, it was probably for the best that he missed the pay-per-view, as the show bombed so badly that Vince shut down the WBF one month later. Luger spent the next seven months sitting at home and collecting paychecks until a great opportunity opened up for him. No, no, not just a great opportunity, the perfect opportunity. Soon after Mr. Perfect turned babyface against Bobby Heenan and the departing Ric Flair, the brain began hyping the impending arrival of Narcissus, named after the Greek mythological figure who was obsessed with his own reflection. Considering the wrestler we're talking about here, it was probably one of the best casting choices Vince had ever made. Luger was paired up with Heenan, who used every indulgent adjective possible to describe Luger's physique. If you hear Vince's voice saying it, it almost sounds perverse. Look at that! Look at that! Oh, yes! You are in love with yourself, and you have every right to be. Lex, please, turn around. Oh, my God. It's like if that one Vince meme with all the facial expressions had audio accompaniment. Ugh. 
The big man finally made his debut with a 93 Royal Rumble, now known as the narcissist Lex Luger. While other recent WCW imports like Flair and Sid Vicious basically got to be themselves, Luger's gimmick was a stone's throw away from all those other occupational gimmicks of the time. All of his mirrors and tassels seemed like the Luger equivalent of Dusty Rhodes' polka dots. Luger was also using a different finisher at this time, knocking jobbers out with his surgically enhanced forearm instead of using the torture rack. Though he was programmed with perfect at WrestleMania Nine, there was little done between the two to set up a feud aside from some promos. While Luger eked out a win in Las Vegas, the match is also known for Kurt Hennig allegedly forgetting his spots and forcing Lex to carry the whole thing. By the time Mania had come and gone, it was obvious that this feud was a one and done, as Luger attacked Bret Hart the day before at the WrestleMania brunch. It seemed inevitable that the two would meet in the finals of that year's King of the Ring tournament, but the company had other plans for both men. Bret won the whole thing and would immediately pivot to a feud with Jerry Lawler, while Luger and Tatanka went to a draw in the last match of the first round, eliminating both men. Five months into his run, Luger was saddled with a one-dimensional gimmick and was put in programs with two top good guys that basically went nowhere. Which, you know, is the ideal setup for a huge main event babyface push! Much like how Ric Flair's departure opened up a spot for Luger in the first place, so did Hulk Hogan's departure after King of the Ring. Hogan dropping the belt to Yokozuna and then taking time off from wrestling created an opportunity for Lex to finally fulfill his destiny as the Hulkster's successor. While Hogan was feuding with Yokozuna, the whole program was presented as the big bad Japanese man going against the heart and soul of the USA. And after Hogan left, it turns out there was still some meat on that bone, so they took that bone and just handed it to Luger. Presto changeo, new American hero! July 4th, 1993, world champion Yokozuna challenged anyone to body slam him on the burning hot deck of the USS Intrepid. After everyone from Scott Steiner to Bill Fralick attempted and failed, the fans pointed to the heavens screaming, it's a bird, it's a plane. Well, it was a helicopter, but you get the point. Who was gonna hop out of the chopper to defend the nation? <laughs> no, kids. Hulk Hogan is a bastard and a coward, and he abandoned our family. This is Lex, your new dad. A lot of fans didn't know what to make of this. Not only was Lex Luger not Hulk Hogan, this is a guy they'd been booing like days before. But it turns out the only thing this man loves more than himself is the good old USA. Even though Hogan beat Yokozuna in seconds to win the title at WrestleMania, one thing he didn't do during their program was to pick him up for a body slam. Luger accomplished what Hogan couldn't and slammed Yoko to the mat. It wasn't perfect, hell it wasn't even as high up as Hogan got Andre, but it was still something and it immediately positioned Lex as the man to challenge for the gold. That being said, where did this big change of heart even come from? There was nothing on TV at all to justify this. Plenty of fans knew Lex Luger from his WCW days, where he also had a lot of face and heel turns that came out of the blue. Just 24 hours earlier, he was still the guy obsessed with his own reflection and cold cocking guys with his forearm on superstars. Now fans were expected to buy the idea that he was suddenly humble and dedicated to a cause higher than himself? Call me cynical, but I'm sure the WWF knew this was a shaky idea, but were confident confident it would succeed on some level. After all, who's going to boo the American gimmick? After picking up the big man, the locker room came out to celebrate this huge occurrence that didn't really prove anything, and Lex was literally paraded around like a statue for the entire national anthem. Could you imagine Hogan sitting on the Steiner shoulders for that long? Mr. Fuji complained that since the slam wasn't good enough, it didn't count, and Luger was owed nothing. And perhaps he was right, as the reactions to the new All-American were mixed at best compared to other faces on the card. Thankfully, Vincent Mann had a plan to make the doubters eat crow and hype everyone up for a big time title match at SummerSlam, a campaign tour. Yes, the Lex Express Tour, a promotional stunt as expensive as it was ineffective. For the next six weeks, the All-American Luger crisscrossed the country in a top-of-the-line tour bus, making towns, kissing babies, shaking hands, and flexing like the perfect image of humility in front of national monuments. And I'm not joking when I called it a campaign tour. The front of the bus literally says a call to action campaign. What was the action that WWF was calling to? Lex Luger, American. That was it. Even for a story as timeless as USA vs. The World, this was a pretty ham-fisted run of appearances. It's like he was running for public office and trying to convince voters, or rather fans, to cheer for him and make him popular enough to be worthy of challenging Yoko for the title. Is that how that works? I just thought you had to win matches. Silly me. 
The WWF's history of trying to force their idea of a top hero onto an unwilling crowd is rich and vast, but this is probably the first big example of that. It also didn't help matters that Lex seemed to have a superstar ego before becoming a superstar. Apparently, he hated traveling on the bus and insisted that he fly from town to town and meet the bus where it stopped, which kind of defeated the whole purpose of the bus tour. Now the bus was only transporting the idea of Lex Luger. And judging from the body language, it looked as if Luger would rather have been anywhere else on the planet than doing this tour meant to endear himself to a large audience. Like his narcissist promos, the new patriotic spiel also seemed limited and one-dimensional. And that's not even taking into account the fact that I've mentioned here before on this channel that talking was never Lex's strong suit. Win, lose, or draw, I know that, I, that whatever I do out there will be 100% effort. When the match is done, I've given it all I have because I'm not just out there for myself. It's, yeah, yeah it, it does add pressure, but I think in a good way. Yay, I'm so won over by you. USA, USA. The company seemed to recognize this issue and tried to further humanize Lex by literally asking the question, who is Lex Luger? My dad was uh, on a music scholarship starting to be a concert pianist and when he was in college. They've got like three cameras on this guy and he's not looking near any of them. Who directed this? I remember singing in chorus and my friends making fun of me and everything when I was in front of the school, but but looking back on it now, I think it, it made me a more well-rounded individual. Wow, just like how Hogan used to play the bass. Lex's reluctance to go all in on this crusade put the success of the campaign in jeopardy. This was an era where non-traditional baby faces like The Undertaker and Razor Ramon were catching fire, making clean-cut goody two-shoes gimmicks feel antiquated. But perhaps most damning of all, though, it was the opinion of the folks who mattered, the fans, that Bret Hart was their choice to carry the mantle. Luger was being compared to Hogan, all right, just more the desperate latter part of Hulkamania than in his prime. But surely these doubts would be put to rest at SummerSlam when Luger would defeat the foreign menace. I mean, Yokozuna's manager, Jim Cornette, even snuck a provision into the contract saying this would be Luger's one and only title match. At this point, it was obvious that Lex was going to topple the giant and win the title. Only that's not exactly what happened. After a main event match that was long and at times arduous to get through, after withstanding every bit of bullshit the heels threw at him, Luger clocked Yokozuna with his loaded forearm. The champion tumbled out of the ring and lost the match by countout, meaning he would ultimately retain his gold. But to Lex Luger, this empty victory was like winning the title, the presidency, the World Series, and American Idol all at once. It's a finish they stole nearly beat for beat from Jim Duggan and Rick Rude from about four years earlier, and it was just as anticlimactic then as it was in 1993. Like, wow, you technically won. Good for you. I guess it was still better than what happened to Cody this year. It made the Federation look foolish in the end. The company dumped tons of money into the Lex Express campaign in their attempt to create a new main event attraction, and all they got out of it was a meaningless ticker tape parade. Not only did the fans fail to fully embrace him, but the man himself seemingly refused to commit to the responsibility of being the face of a company, which forced the WWF to reconsider its choices. But as cheesy as the Express was, had they pulled the trigger on Luger as champion and it paid off, I think we'd be saying a lot more positive things about it today. Lex got another crack at Yoko, though, as he led his Survivor Series team of the All-Americans, joined by the Steiner brothers and The Undertaker, who was a last-minute replacement for Tatanka, against Yokozuna and his foreign fanatics. Luger was the sole survivor for his team, but again he missed the mark on definitively trouncing Yoko, as he and The Undertaker were counted out before Lex finished Ludwig Borga. Yeah, that'll show those Finnish bastards! We're mad at them too, right? At the turn of 94, once again, the valiant and courageous Lex Luger asked his fans to harass President Jack Tunney into giving him what he wanted by letting him enter the Royal Rumble match. And after weeks of an aggressive opinion poll campaign that was also a sneaky way to get people on their catalog mailing list, President Tunney allowed Luger into the match. Ah, so now it all makes sense. Luger's quest for championship glory will conclude at WrestleMania 10. Biggest show of the year, Madison Square Garden, the first WrestleMania without Hulk Hogan in any capacity. If there was a time to strap this guy up, this was it. Only instead of that, Vince McMahon could feel the winds of change and use the Rumble match as a straw poll of sorts. For the first and only time, officially that is, the Rumble ended in a tie between Luger and former champ Bret Hart. The fans couldn't have made it more clear who they were behind. Who won the Royal Rumble?
The WWF tried to spin it best they could, but there was no denying that the fans had chosen the tried and true hitman over Luger. This huge controversy was settled the old fashioned way via a coin flip with Luger winning and getting the first shot at the title against Yokozuna at Mania. Finally, in one last attempt at market research, they ran an angle a month before the big show at a superstars taping where Luger stole the belt from Yokozuna and was later introduced as champion to gauge fans reaction. The fans didn't seem all that excited about it, partly because everyone knew he wasn't really the champion. What the hell purpose did this serve? Okay, Lex, you're never going to win this thing, but I'll just let you hold it so you know how it feels. Who's the big champion? You's a big boy champion. <clears throat> You may be shocked to find out that Lex did not win the title at MSG. The match was about 70% nerve hold, but this time instead of a lame count out, it was a lame DQ thanks to special guest referee Mr. Perfect. It was actually some good storytelling from the previous year's mania, but again, Lex came off looking like a dope instead of a conquering hero. When he shook Brett's hand at the end of the night, even he seemed to be signaling that his days as the company's great red, white, and blue hope were done. Well, that was a lot of time and effort flushed down the toilet, but hey, don't worry, Lex has got a solid program coming up with Mr. Perfect. <laughs> of course that didn't happen because Hennig's old back injury would flare up and take him off TV before they ever had another match. Lex was shuffled into a consolation feud with Crush, who himself was lukewarm after losing his feud to Randy Savage. It's crazy to see how far Luger's stock had fallen since the previous August, all while Brett was having a killer feud with his brother Owen over the belt. Things got real grim for the All-American American by SummerSlam 94, as his former good buddy Tatanka began accusing Lex of selling out to Ted DiBiase and the Million Dollar Corporation. Though in my opinion, it wasn't so much the selling out that was a bad thing, it was the idea that he was joining up with DiBiase. I mean, as a manager, he sucked. Just the worst! By this point, the WWF was desperate to make fans care about Luger, as they once again utilized a fan poll to gauge how they felt about Tatanka's accusations. 54% of you said yes, he sold out. 46% of you said no. Yeah, sure seems like a baby face everyone's getting behind, doesn't it? In an alternate world, this could have been a good opportunity for Luger to turn heel and be set up as a challenger down the line. Might have gone over better than Bob Backlund and King Mabel. Instead, everyone saw it coming except for Lex when it was Tatanka who took the money and joined DiBiase's faction. The scintillating Luger to Tonka feud lingered for months, first peaking at the Survivor Series when Lex's Guts and Glory team fell to the corporation, then again in a steel cage match on a Sunday Night Slam special that was meant to promote WrestleMania 11. Luger won that blow off match in decisive fashion, one of the few times that ever seemed to happen for him. Though for all the time they spent on it, wouldn't it have made more sense for the blow off to happen at WrestleMania? Well, don't worry about that because the company had plans, I mean really big plans for both of these guys. That's right, Tatanka would be in Bam Bam Bigelow's corner for his match with Lawrence Taylor, while Luger would team with the British Bulldog as the Allied Powers. Wow. In a Mania to Mania drop off so huge, I have no idea how it didn't end up on my own countdown about them. Luger went from challenging for the WWF title of beating up Jacob and Eli Blue, thrown together with a tag team partner on the loosest of premises, flags. Do you have a flag? <laughs> Jesus, how dire was the tag team scene in 95 that that match made it onto WrestleMania? And next you're going to tell me the Bushwhackers were still around then. Oh no. As spring turned to summer, Lexi and Davey earned a tag title match against Owen Hart and Yokozuna at the second ever In Your House. Maybe this would finally be Lex's chance to grab some gold. Well, nope. Yokozuna ended up pinning Luger clean in the middle to retain. Talk about a fall from grace. Hey Bulldog, figuratively speaking, what happened to Lex and all his momentum the year prior? With the heel lineup in the Federation looking just as bad as the tag scene, the Bulldog turned on world champ Diesel the following month while Lex was nowhere to be found. While it was speculated that Lex might have changed his ways as well, we never got a definitive answer. He interfered on Diesel's behalf in the main event of SummerSlam 95, but was thanked with a boot to the face, never to be seen again in the WWF. Luger saw the writing on the wall. At this point, he seemed destined for mid-card purgatory in the Fed and reached out to Eric Bischoff about a return to WCW. Not really wanting Luger back because of his attitude when leaving the company three years earlier, Bischoff lowballed him, offering one-fifth of his previous WCW contract. But to Bischoff's surprise, Luger accepted. 
Consider the fact that Lex Luger was known as the first wrestler to have his own agent. I mean, it tells you the kind of smart businessman he was back then. That said, how bad do you think he felt his prospects in the Federation were to take that deal? Because of the secretive nature of the deal, Luger kept McMahon and the WWF in the dark about his plans while he was still negotiating a contract extension. One night after wrestling a house show for the Federation, the total package once again made history. It was on that inaugural episode of Monday Nitro in September of 1995 where Lex in his silly shirt made a shocking return to WCW, considered the first real shot of the Monday Night War. And through the highs and lows, he would remain a vital part of the company until its closure in 2001. And that, in a nutshell, was Lex Luger's time in the WWF. Some might say the company botched a sure thing with him, but did they really? I don't know! From Tom McGee to the Ultimate Warrior, Vincent Mann spent years looking for a new Hulk Hogan, and they almost got one in Luger. But by the early 90s, that type of hero had begun to turn passe. The fans who were still around were fatigued by the scandals that came in the wake of the 80s boom, and the counterculture influences that would spawn ECW and the Attitude Era were just beginning to bubble. We've seen throughout history how fans tend to resist when promoters are really keen on pushing their next big star. But in Luger's case, it wasn't just the ham-fisted way they went about it, but the fact that he was just too close to the last guy. The next big star is always the inverse of the last big star. Steve Austin was the opposite of Hulk Hogan, just like John Cena was the opposite of Austin. A big reason guys like Roman Reigns and Sheamus failed as babyfaces was because they were portrayed too much like Cena, and fans could see right through it. Lex Luger failed in the WWF because he was presented as a less than version of yesterday's hero in Hogan with a face turn that felt totally unearned. And let's be honest, Luger's reputation as a backstage prima donna at the time probably didn't help matters either. His unwillingness to go along fully with the Lex Express and his inability to feign excitement over it probably didn't endear him to upper management. Luger has said in more recent interviews that he regrets a lot of the negative things he did in his career, like leaving the WWF without informing Vince McMahon. Had his attitude been better, and perhaps if he went to the Federation in 87 instead of Jim Crockett Promotions, his career could have taken a very different path. But by the time he was positioned as the WWF's next hero, it was too late, and the fans were ready to leave him, as well as the guy he was most closely compared to, in the past. But what did you think of Lex Luger's run in the Federation? Could it have been saved? Let me know in the comment section below. Be sure to give the video a thumbs up if you like it, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, hit that bell icon to get all the notifications. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.